I come from a long line of educators, so I, that's why I thought, well, I like words, we like talking. There's Money Where Your Mouth is is in its fourth um, iteration, and then wow. uh, Voice Orvis for Podcasting was presented by my publisher to to be more of a creative approach to podcasting rather than yeah. the technical stuff. There are a lot of them that are very yeah. technical, mm -hmm. and this is more the creative side of it. That's and good. so it balances that part out. And then my new book, Speak to Achieve, is about corporate training. So that'll be out next year. George the Tech. Hey, everybody. Another in the series of our George the Tech trusted partner interviews. And today, the hardest part about today is figuring out what we shouldn't talk about because my guest... Elaine Clark is an incredible Renaissance woman of voiceover, audio, production, technology, training, content, authorship, everything. I mean, she goes on. So let's get right into it. How are you doing, Elaine? I'm good. How are you, George? I'm great. I'm really glad to have you. Um, we've been, I mean, we've been chatting before we hit record and I was like, we need to start recording because <laughs> we're already getting into some fun stuff. But um, in the scope of this conversation, this is really about you and about what you offer to the world. You know, whether the scope of your offerings, the skill sets that you offer, and the different businesses and entrepreneurs and talent that can benefit from it. But of course, first, just tell us a little bit about your background. It's, it's long and storied, but a little bit about your background and what's gotten you to where you are today as a, as a really trusted provider of, of really just knowledge for voiceover actors. Man, my brain is big with knowledge. So, so I was a theater major in college. I moved to San Francisco um, uh, over 40 years ago and got into voiceovers. And at that point, it was only about uh, like 50 people in the market that were doing it. So we learned just by working with an individual, working with a producer. And so uh, sort of had to figure out our system of how to do that. So also during that time, I was a media buyer at an advertising agency, then became, um, uh, went into radio sales, and I was a copywriter. I worked at a casting director's office. I worked in, the, in a recording studio, which was really fun because that's where Paul Fries would come in, and so I got to spend oh, time wow. with him. Yes. And I have many stories uh, about that. And so I just learned things from the inside out, and yeah. then um, I started um, a voiceover school in 1986, which I which I owned and operated for 32 years before selling it. Right before the pandemic, I can't even like fathom that because the world of voiceover for me didn't start until 2004 or five when I was really introduced to the well, business, and you were already teaching the act, the art of voice acting, 20 years before that. Yes, it was. It was one of those. Um, strange things that I was at a party and someone said, have you seen that, you know, that you can do voiceovers? Like, what was that? I never thought of how do sounds get into commercials or into cartoons. They were just there. So, um, so I just, you know, got into it slowly when it was real to real and that's R E E L yeah. mm -hmm. rather than real. <laughs> so, yes. um, and then, so it progressed from real to real into cassette and to, and to, CD Dat. and to MP3, so I've done the whole yep. thing. And so, anyway, in the early 90s, uh, people kept asking me, well, before I started the school and when I, when I started it, how do, you, how do you do voiceover? So I then decided to write a book so that I, people would leave me alone. That's how funny it was. It was <laughs> I was like, going to say, why does anybody choose to write a book? Because it's certainly not to make money, right? <laughs> no, it was just like, oh, I, there are only so many lunches you can do, you know, and... I so I wrote the book and, and this is before internet, before we all yes. had websites and all these other means to communicate, right? This right. was it, a book. So I, I wrote the book and then I thought, now I'm done. Okay. And then all these other people started coming in. So the business started growing and also the video game industry was growing. So I was casting and directing video games and working on corporate narration and and on camera narrating and, and working in trade shows. So I've I've done sort of the whole gamut of, of yeah. that sort of voiceover work and, and then learned audio production. You'll appreciate this because uh, I was, was... That was the part I was curious about. When did the technology, the more technical side of all this come into play for you? you know, I first started in the studio and it was 
you know, you had the big console and you had the, mm -hmm. the, the tape decks or the 24 tracks or the 12 tracks. And I know that all the engineers had like fingers and elbows and they were record and you go and you didn't want to mess it up. You needed to do full takes. So otherwise you had to slice out all that work. I knew I couldn't do anything, you know, engineering with tape. That was just way too complicated for me because the, every single engineer would drop that little piece of tape on the floor and the pile of tape and go, who, which one? Let's just do oh that again. Gosh. It was it was a mess. And so I was uh, and I've been directing demos and on audio projects for, you know, for decades. So one engineer so you're in studios a lot. You were I in, grew you up know, you as were, an adult yeah. in recording studios. And then I was as I was directing a, a demo and and I kept, I was leaning over uh, the engineer's shoulder and say, no, put that part with this part and edit that stuff together. And then he got out of his chair and said, sit down. And so I sat down, he said, you do it. And he stood behind me and showed me how. So he was doing this in a supportive way. Yeah, and I think also out of annoyance because I was just really just well, saying, do just this. Well, just like you had to write a book to get everybody to stop bugging you about how to voiceover. He's like, if I don't show this lady how to run this board eventually, she's I'm going to go nuts. Yes. So I'm yes. going to show this lady how to run the board. And so that's how it started. So we he just worked with me until I got relatively good. And one of the, the big projects that I did early on was recording Amy Tan reading one of her books, The Opposite of Fate. And hmm. I ended up getting an Audi Award for that, not because I had brilliant... Wow. Um, engineering skills because I was working with a great author really and it's great when you hit your wagon to the right uh, the right I, town yes. and, and it just it's uh, but it's like everybody I know in, in recording engineering I've read all the mix magazine and recording mm -hmm. magazine and tape op interview everybody that is like in an interview now it happened because they were in the right place at, at the, the right time right you know now luck does favor the prepared you still have to have the skills to be there and back it up. So that's how that kind of started for you. You got to record a great talent. Yes. And, and then, started there. And then just recording demos. So it was in order to still be a, a working actor and having some flexibility and um, before going off to other studios and having my own studio, it made it a little bit easier to reschedule if if I got a big gig or the other person got a big gig rather than saying, oh, you know, we have to pay for the studio, we can't go, or we have to give up one of our other jobs. So it gave me more flexibility having that studio. Yeah. Um, I realized then when I had my own recording studio why I was invited to all the recording studio parties because mm. <laughs> just using all of them. And they were like, here's a good client. You know, let's bring her in. Right. So I. So you were an insider, insider. I was an insider's yeah. insider. Yeah. So it was it was fun, and and everyone had their own style. I just sort of learned by ear, training, and then yeah. I felt really badly for a while because in setting up my studio, I couldn't do it on my own, but I could make something sound good once it was recorded. And then I talked mm. to one of the the major recording studios in the city and said, well. How do you do that? I said, well, we hire someone. We hire a tech to come in and fix that. So I was like, okay, if the big studios are doing that, then I can do it too. I don't feel so badly about that. We all have our skill set, but it doesn't have to be everything. I didn't know that. This is why I was, when I was going through college, I was misdirected, not by really anybody's fault, I don't think. But I thought if I wanted to be a recording engineer or work with recording tech, that I had to literally be an engineer. I, I went to school for engineering, like electrical engineering. And it was really a misdirection because it was not the, the field I really needed to be in. I wasn't wanting to be a lab tech and designing. I wanted to be running the equipment. So I had to pivot and go to music and get a music degree. And, and it all worked out in the end. But I didn't realize that those, those, those worlds were totally separate from each other. Right. And that just because you have the artist's ear and you know how to process eq compress mix and all that doesn't mean you know how the board works or how the acoustics should be tuned or you know all that it's a, they're all different little worlds so what Absolutely. an interesting thing to experience right yeah and it it was very helpful from from the advertising casting director recording studio audio engineer performer perspective to know when i coach what is working and what isn't so that's where it would go. You know, the performance is really good, but it's too punchy. 
and inconsistent for audio. This sounds good, but it's not going to relate to the audience this well. So mm. here are some adjustments to get that connection, that personal connection, having worked at the advertising yeah. agency. And then if it was a media buyer, you know, when I was a media buyer and in radio sales, it was like we had to really target the audience and the different times. And this is, you know, where it was vertical versus horizontal sales, which is something that mm. I put in my voiceovers for podcasting book. And, yeah. and people in podcasting were like, whoa, we've never heard of that. Well, that's an advertising technique of how, right. to, how to set it up. I, I also got a degree in education, and I come from a long line of educators. So I, that's why I thought, well, I like words. We like talking. There's Money Where Your Mouth Is is in its fourth um, iteration. And then wow. uh, VoiceOvers for Podcasting was presented by my publisher to, to be more of a creative approach to podcasting. Rather than yeah. the technical stuff, there are a lot of them that are very yeah. technical, mm -hmm. and this is more the creative side of it. That's and good. And so it balances that part out. And then my new book, Speak to Achieve, is about corporate training. So that'll be out next year. Oh, so, very good. Yeah. Very good. I was at PodFest, and I'm always going to give credit to Jody Krangle. I would not have been there without her because she encouraged me to come, and she gave me her companion pass. Which yes. was like a VIP pass. So and, I had, it was my first time. History about Jody Krangle. Years ago, Harlan Hogan and I would, would co teach uh, in New York and, and DC and Florida area. And he would do a marketing class and I would have a, a, a performance class. And Jody was one of my students 20 something years ago. No way. Yes. Along She's, with a she, bunch of really talented people that you probably know. And so yeah. it was like an amazing class. And all of your students 20 years ago have been my colleagues and clients for the yes. last 20 years. Well, totally. that's what's so funny. And I'm, I'm, I've am I'm, decided not to get old. So that's my. You're ageless. You're ageless. I'm trying um, to. Yeah, yeah, I was at PodFest and I was in line at like a, at like a cocktail hour. Mm -hmm. And I, there's a lady standing in front of me and I could have just stared stared at my shoes or mm -hmm. God knows what, but I struck up a conversation and now it's turning into a, a product idea of creating um, a training process and equipment packages and everything for executives, for C-suite people. Oh, that's, that's fantastic. Because the other thing that I do in addition to coaching voice actors is I coach podcasters. So I've yeah, they uh, need worked it. with, well, some of them <laughs> do, and it. other ones are already fantastic. So Yeah, some, you know, some uh, come from a background of presenting or public speaking. Yeah. or Jordan Harbinger has been one of my major um, clients all these years, and we're friends. And he was already, you know, had five or 10 million followers. But then it's like, okay, but I'm, I, I can always get better. So we've gotten yeah. so that we just have a little shorthand of how, of how, um, you know, a little sections might need a little change, but he's he's fantastic. And then I'm working with other people, and they they are uh, they're saying now I'm winning the awards for in my category for the best podcaster, and I'm working on one person right now who's in you know in corporate training just because they're an attorney and trying to get get that voice and the message yep. across in a different yep. way. But I've worked mm -hmm. with sports announcers and uh, a lot of newscasters weather reporters, a lot of the C-suite, and people pre prepping for a TEDx or a TED Talk, uh, yeah. people who are going to be interviewed, sales teams. So that's why my other book is about the corporate side. So it has the voiceover, the podcasting, the corporate, because that's also that's something timing. that I have done all, all three things for the last 40 years. So it's like I have so many stories and so many bits of advice because every yeah. style is different. In our service offerings at Georgia the Tech, we have been voiceover number one for years, and we're seeing that there are other needs out there. Of course, podcasting we know, but yeah, this other side of the corporate executive C-suite. By C-suite, mm -hmm. we mean CEOs, CFOs, COOs, right? Right. Uh, the first time somebody dropped the C-suite, jargon on me a few months ago, literally a few months ago for the okay. first time I heard it. And it was like, oh yeah, I love that plugin. I use it all the time because we have a oh, plugin a for audio yes. called C-Suite C-Vox. And they're like, she's like, what are you talking about? 
Oh, and I'm like, what so are you talking funny. about? So I learned about what C-suite meant. You know, it's just like, you don't know what you don't know, right? So yeah. finding out about that that niche and that need. So this book that you're coming out with is going to be huge. And we'll definitely be wanting to share that with people as we start talking to more and more uh, C-suite type people. Um, I think it's fantastic that you're doing that. When did you transition to podcast and then find the C-suite thing as a I've been doing C-suite s- since the the 90s the early 90s it's always just been one of your well many part hats. of it you is just... yeah i the thing is uh people know me for the, for the school that i had but that was one reason why i sold it because i had this other business what it built up was the school was weekends and evenings and the other stuff was during the day so i just wanted to keep <sighs> my daytime work yeah and have my weekends and evenings back. So now it's a little bit more manageable, although I always seem to fill it with something, like writing a book isn't something you go, oh, I'll just write for three hours and I'll be done. No. It decides to write itself when you want to. I'm going to broach this subject because it's absolutely the elephant in the room. While I was at PodFest, I went to a panel, and it was about how to write your first book using AI. Oh. What is your thoughts on using AI tools to enhance your let's just say enhance your productivity do you have an ethical and moral line that you will not cross in terms of automation right Right. because we know so many things are being replaced and can be replaced for example i will never use ai to write the majority of a book for example you know how do you feel about that stuff i think that ai in writing is if you go what does it really mean to be crunchy granola you know, when you're giving a speech. <laughs> and then I and I just wanted to know what AI would say. You know, so it's just about the earth and, you know, being green. And I just wanted to, to know what that would mean. And I said, what's, what would be like a, a, a bully speech? And then it sort of gave examples and other stuff. So it was, it was just helpful in thinking about what are the extremes. I, I use it as an experiment to see what it's yeah. going to say, see. Or say, yeah. and then it's I go, pre, well, it's that's... It's a pre and, Yeah, and then I go, well, that's kind of, that's not really what I wanted, or that's really right. weird, or whatever. And then it might open up another idea in my head that then... Yeah. Or or it has that one word that I was looking for that I didn't couldn't find, you know, just yeah. in my own vocabulary. There was like, oh, right. that's what it is. That's so it's not word. really taking that and having it write a book, but it's using sure. it like a Google search. Sure. So that's so. So you do find that you're using AI tools to help inspire the writing of your book. Inspire, but not writing. So, yeah. but that mm-hmm. might be. Uh, I was like, how does this work in the corporate arena, or how would this be in like a CFO? Even though I worked with them, and then I'll just say, here are the things a CFO does. I'm like, whoa, right. I don't live that life, but I'm fixing that yeah. problem. So right. that's where it just, it, it illuminates something that stimulates an idea that I will write something that's very specific. What's been really cool is that, you know, I have my two apps, Activate Your Voice and Adding Melody to Your Voice. And um, recently I've had three major articles written, one in, in uh, USA Today, another one in OK Magazine, and another one in International Business Times. So I'm getting noticed for the variety of stuff that I have out there that I'm providing. That's great. So oh, wow. coach people in all areas of the business and produce demos, of course, for people who are in voiceovers and then coach. And my my foundation is really in kinesthetic movement in order to connect with emotions and stories and using the rhetorical triangle to make sure that you have a balance of your ethos, logos, and pathos. I had no idea that was part of your basis. I did not know that. Yeah. Read my books, man. All right. I obviously need to read your books. I've just showed my hand. I obviously haven't read the book. I have yeah. some reading to catch up on. <laughs> and are they, are they also in audiobook form, your books? Well, I have um, voiceovers for podcasting as audiobook. But instead, what I did with uh, There's Money Where Your Mouth Is, I created um, a podcast. So after I wrote voiceovers for podcasting, people said, where's your podcast? It was like, oh, oh, why do people keep saying that? Now I have to do something else. So I thought, well, why do I? It's just an expectation, yeah. So I have, I just have the first season out tonight. And after I finish writing this other book, I'll have other seasons. But it's called Real Talking Tips. And so it's a 52-episode micro-learning lesson that supports both of those books and the new one that's coming out. 
of how to learn something, you know, bit by bit, it has little segments that might be about my system making it mine, which is about motivation, intention, needs, and em need and emotions. That's uh, a system that I created uh, based on my frustration as being a stage actor and getting into the immediacy of voiceover. So I found a system yeah. that worked. So that's that's mine that I've trademarked and registered. So I have have a variety of 52 things. Fifty two episodes. I I, 52. I just subscribed to it on my oh, Spotify uh, yeah, podcatcher thanks. here. Yeah, and they can yeah. uh, look at all of it on my website, elaineclarkvo.com. So, this is perfect for the uh, short attention span, ADHD, uh, brain me, which is me. Uh, yeah, it's so hard to sit down and focus on reading a, even a book that would be hugely beneficial. I mm -hmm. still have a hard time focusing for very long, but even having these bite-sized episodes to listen to and learn from is going to. I'm going right. to. This is absolutely something that's going to be in my fantastic in my rotation. Yeah, yeah, and what and because I also come from an educational background, and it sets up the problem. It tells you here are the solutions, how to do it, and gives everyone an assignment. Now, it's not super hard, but it's something that you might, you know, want to think about and work on and That's absorb. That's great. I have literally never heard a podcast that has an assignment yeah. at the end of the so episode. It's That's great. a micro-learning lesson, 52 yeah. of those. But that's why I'll have other ones, and who knows? You might be on one of the next episodes. <laughs> I would love to be a part of that. I love seeing how you use media. I think you've always, I've always looked at you as a bit of a trailblazer, releasing your apps uh, early on in the game when a lot of us were just learning about apps to begin with. You were releasing apps. Um, I'm going to tell my daughter about the apps because she's in the beginning of a voiceover training process with my friend Martha Kahn and, you know, I think yeah. an app is going to speak to a teenager in a way that other things wouldn't, well, you know? I'll tell you that the, the Activate Your Voice app is only 99 cents and it's a five minute voice and diction exercise that I've been using for a long time. It's also a grounding uh, process. So a lot of people in business and the C-suite use it before going into a meeting. So it's just ground your voice. It gives more resonance and presence to it. And in the old days, we used to say stick to tape. So mm -hmm. that's where uh, that's where that comes in. And then adding melody to your voice, that's where I really refined the word emphasis chart and how to use the body. And so I, I wrote about it in the book, but now you can see and hear it, whether you want to see things on my website, on YouTube, or listen to it on any of the yeah. other podcasting It's places. so smart to be available on these platforms because everybody is, like I said, for me, it'd be much easier to consume your information in podcast form. Other people, a, a, an app form is going to speak to them. And this app, I, I just looked on my Mac, so it's available actually as an app for the Mac, but it's also available on mobile devices. So it's, you know, for iPhone or, or for Android and for tablets. So that you can, you, a lot of people could just warm up as they're walking around the house, um, practice it. The adding melody to your voice has a place where I've recorded something and showed a little uh, message of what to do on how to move the voice around. And then you can record yourself, listen back, and see how it matches. So that's interactive. That's also part of being an app. So, but that's just, this is where I've benefited from being in the San Francisco Bay Area from 1979 on, and I have a little bit of information, I was in the very first sales training uh, video for Microsoft when they had 25 employees and were still located in Silicon Valley. So I played someone called uh, Emily Finley, and so I was part of the sales team. And then I was also the voice of the next computer when Steve Jobs was kicked out of, out of Apple. Are you kidding me? No. You were the voice of next? Yes. No so, way. Yeah. So that was kind of kind of fun. And then I've been working with the, the founder of, of uh, you know, World <laughs> of Wonder and Teddy Ruxpin, you know, for the last 40 years on various toys. That's, I mean, there's some real advantage of being in that environment in the Bay Area, Silicon Valley, et cetera, because I yes. know a lot of people believe in the ability to bump into people. Mm -hmm. You know, there was that, the fellow who passed away, unfortunately, the, the CEO of Zappos, he created this this environment in downtown Las Vegas that was all about that. He wanted his coworkers and his employees and everybody to have a square. And he made this like fake town square where they would literally just see each other and bump into each other and to have that place of sharing of ideas in this physical 
real environment. Right. You know, what a thing, like, to be able to do that. And nowadays, of course, it's all mostly virtualized now. But because of that place of where you've been, you've had that opportunity, and you've obviously taken advantage of it. Well, (laughs) that's that's it. And that's why when the video games started taking off in the 90s, so I was hired as one of, like, three or four other people that were directing in uh, video games in the 90s and, and 2000s. We were coming up with a lot of the terminology. So it's kind of fun. Some of it stuck, some of it didn't. Sometimes I hear the yeah. stuff that I came up with uh, was a the yeah. term and, and go, oh, it's so great because other people what's are saying What's an example? This. Before we drop it off here, what's one, uh, can you think of one of those those terms that you oh, yeah. hear once in a while? Um, uh, there was parsing and concatenation, and that would also be called branching. So that just meant oh. you have your, uh, I came up with the term branching. Most people uh-huh. didn't use that. They went with concatenation and parsing, but I thought of it as a tree with branches and you have little leaves on them. And then the parsed word is like a leaf. And the, you have yeah. your basic structure of the story. And then you have the offshoots, which are the limbs. And then the, the one word that would be replaced was the leaf. So that's why I called it visual. branching. Yeah, it's much more visual. That, that makes a lot of sense. So that was just one. So when someone says branching, I go, yay. I hate that I have to say goodbye because I literally have another conversation scheduled on our heels. So that's literally the only reason I have to say goodbye because I could talk to you for a long time. And thank you. And most importantly, we didn't, we're burying the lead here. How the heck do people find you? Obviously, we're going to have a link right on this page on our trusted partners page. But where should they go to find you? Because you have so much in going on. I would just suggest going to my website, elaineclarkvo.com. So that's the best place. And if you want to check out the apps, just type in Elaine Clark apps. If you want to look at books, you go to Elaine A. Period Clark. Or you can go to my IMDB page, which also has the middle initial A because that's my SAG name. So mm-hmm. you can check things out. Some of the, some right. of the shows I've been in, you know, because I do a little bit on camera as well. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Thanks for your time. I really appreciate you partnering up with us over here and being an affiliate and uh, you're an amazing person. Thank you for your time. And so are you. (laughs) Cheers. Cheers.